Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you were in India during a particularly interesting time with respect to foreign relations with the United States. This was a time when India was following the, the Treaty of Peace with China, the so-called Panchila, and uh, Mr. Dulles was then Secretary of State. His view of the world at that time was a highly bipolarized world in which he regarded it as a moral obligation for other countries such as India to side either with the Soviet Union or with the United States. <clears throat> I'm wondering uh, the extent to which you were able to convey this uh, foreign policy concept, especially of Mr. Dulles, to Prime Minister Nehru, in that context which it would appear was rather antagonistic to the Dulles point of view at that time. <clears throat> yes, that's true. The, uh, <clears throat> you're quite right. The uh, <clears throat> India, China, <clears throat> Hindi, Chini, Bye Bye, our brothers was uh, quite prevalent when I first arrived there. But uh, <clears throat> uh, talking with the President Eisenhower, before I went out, he took a p rather <clears throat> dispassionate view, not as uh, uh, acute as uh, Secretary Dulles of our relations, I think, of the bipolar world and particularly of our relations with India, and who <clears throat> asked me to see whether we couldn't try to arrive at some basis of better understanding with the Indians <clears throat> that uh, on the basis of our policy at the time that uh, we didn't uh, want to take sides between India and Pakistan. We, uh, we appreciated uh, what their problems were. We wanted to be helpful. <clears throat> and we were very helpful to them, as you recall. Our aid program was very large at that time. Uh, as was also the Ford Foundation's uh, uh, operation there uh, under Douglas Ensminger. And I think our assistance uh, uh, came to about, uh, including Food for Peace, about $750 million a year at that time, that level, and was greatly appreciated. Uh, when I first got there, uh, Mr. Nero asked me to come to see him alone at his home, and I went to see him, and he, he uh, explained to me what uh, his policies, what his view was of the situation in India itself and in their relations with the other countries. He, um, while we felt and I think Mr. Dulles felt too that the Indians were very partial to the Soviets and the Chinese. Uh, Mr. Nero really took the position that uh, that he wanted <coughs> he wanted to put establish uh, put our relations on a sound basis and a friendly basis. That he thought. Uh, there were situations, in, particularly in the Soviets, which were applicable to India at the time as an underdeveloped country. And uh, that uh, uh, first there had to be more governmental intervention, uh, that India was inexperienced in the forms of democracy operating on its own as such. Uh, <clears throat> that, uh, and this is where I think Mr. Nero perhaps was in error, that for a, an underdeveloped country to progress, it had to progress uh, industrially. The industrial base had to be expanded. And uh, this was their reason for, <clears throat> in some extent, uh, uh, following the Russian example. Uh, and there are many people today in India, including B.K. Nero, who was their ambassador to the United States, you know, some years ago. and. Uh, whom I knew very well there, who have always maintained that uh, for a country like India to follow the Western democratic processes, government, is very difficult and perhaps not possible. That there has to be more autonomy than is a country with 16 different la official languages, national languages, and God knows how many uh, uh, dialects, uh, and uh, with uh, uh, rivalry between the North and the South, and um, 
with the various, between the various parts of the country, that's very difficult to operate in our form. Uh, and I think, um, I think the president had a better feeling for that than Foster. The, I remember coming back on consultation once and uh, meeting with the president and with some of the cabinet and some criticism of the Indian intervention in the private sector uh, was when they wanted to aid to build a steel mill and uh, criticism of their not going through the private sector. And the president said, well, you must remember that their condition is very different from ours. We started with an empty country with only four million people when we got our independence and we had all kinds of all wide field to develop here. And India started with a huge population in an area half the United States or less. The situation is quite different. So I did find more a more sympathetic approach on the part of, of President Eisenhower than, than uh, Mr. Dulles. But I must say uh, that, uh, that Foster didn't try to interfere with my efforts there at all in any sense. I never had any problems with him. He, he, he didn't, uh, I, in fact, I rarely heard from him. And um, let me go ahead on my own so that uh, uh, <coughs> we did try to explain our position and 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 uh, demonstrated our sympathy by giving us large amounts of assistance to them didn't approve everything they did we we did think they got too involved in the public sector in trying to run <clears throat> in some of the industry itself didn't do it as efficiently as as the private sector did but uh, nevertheless recognized the fact that uh, they were a developing country and and were feeling their way. During this time, uh, Krishna Menon, as foreign minister, was a very uh, controversial personality, as we know, and was especially disliked by some segments of the American public. Oh, yes. And I, I wonder, were most, were most of your relations uh, with Krishna Menon as foreign minister or with Mr. Nehru? And, no, and my, most of my relations, well, most of my relations were with Mr. Nehru. Mm -hmm. But uh, Krishna Menon was then appointed defense minister. And so I had some relations with him as defense minister. I remember, it's a peculiar person, of course, um, he having sent for me once to come to his office and complained about our giving some planes to Pakistan. He went on for half an hour or so, and complaining vigorously, suddenly went to sleep. The bearer came in with a cup of tea and revived him. He started all over again. The next time I had an uh, experience with Krishna was at the time of the Chinese incursion in 59. And he called me up and said, uh, are you busy today? I said, yes, I'm busy, but not so busy that I can't see you. When do you want me to come and see you? He said, I want to come and see you. I said, that's fine, come over for tea then. So he came over and he said, I, I want to buy 29 C-119s. I need them right away. It's the only way we can get supplies up to the border and I want them at a cheap price. Well, I said, I'm afraid they've all been allocated out, but I'll see what I can do for you. And I thought we ought to try to do something for them and try to uh, comply with their request. And I sent an urgent night action message to the department and we did get the planes together. Got some in Okinawa, some in Europe, some from the States, and got them there in a few days. And of course, he was delighted, and he gave a reception for the crews, and was joking with them, and wisecracking, and great good spirits. I met him later in the day <clears throat> at another reception, and I said, well, Krishna, I think we did a pretty good job for you. His response was, yes, people say I can't get anything out of the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> that was the thanks we got for <laughs> supplying him the planes. But it, the fact, that was one factor that had a great influence in our relations with the Indians. The fact that we came up right away with some assistance to them. And I was, in a sense, almost a turning point mm. from that time. Because when President Eisenhower came there, he had the most tremendous reception anyone had ever had in India. We had, uh, I remember, uh, well, I barely got there in time, and Mr. Nero and the President of India barely got there in time to meet him. We had uh, cars four abreast on a two-lane highway out in the fields trying to get to the airport. 
I uh, finally got out, a policeman came along and I said, you've got to get me out there. He said, I think you'll have to get out and walk, Mr. Ambassador. Mm. I got out and started walking and finally two young women came along in a little Volkswagen and said, do you want a lift? I said, I certainly sure do. Well, I made it in time and Mr. Nero just got there as the plane touched ground. But then he, they took him in, in the long way in to New Delhi and uh, the, the, the whole route was thronged with people pressing up to the car, trying to shake his hand. Finally, we got into Connaught Circus in the center of New Delhi, and the whole procession stopped. And Mr. Nero got out and joined the police to clear the way. And uh, <laughs> I complimented him afterwards. He said, yes, I like direct action, <coughs> direct action. But, and um, then uh, every, the president had an enormous welcome. And, and in his last day, he and Mr. Nero spoke in the parade grounds between Old and New Delhi, and uh, the police estimated there were 800,000 people turned out for it, seeing the housetops and the streets coming into the parade grounds. And um, uh, I remember uh, sitting, they were up on the podium platform and uh, sitting with, uh, with Indira, and she said they've just sent word up to Father that he's got to keep on talking for another 15 minutes because there's crowd getting out from a cricket match and they can't handle this crowd. So Mr. Nero, who was never at a loss for speaking, he went on for another 15 minutes, finally came out. But um, Khrushchev came out two months later, a very interesting comparison. He didn't begin to get the crowd, the turnout that, uh, that President Eisenhower got. <clears throat> My, uh, we went out to meet him, of course, at Palom Airport. And uh, my uh, Turkish colleague, with a great sense of humor, and he said, uh, Ellsworth, he said, did you, on your way out, did you notice all those uh, bullet carts with their rumps to the road? <laughs> the government filled up the empty spaces with bullet carts. Mm. So it was the comparison with President Eisenhower wouldn't be too great. But he did get a tremendous reception. and. Uh, uh, this whole episode of the Chinese incursion, I think, from then on, our relations uh, continue to improve. Then uh, <clears throat> I think they later deteriorated somewhat, but now have gotten on a fairly realistic basis. And I, I think that, 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 as I was there now just uh, recently, uh, <coughs> And particularly with the Janata government, uh, they're not not so biased or not as leaning as much toward the Soviets as they were that they want to try to develop a more even-handed policy. You mentioned the Chinese incursion and how that was a, a landmark in the evolution of our relations with India. There was some speculation in this country, and you, you, you're aware, uh, without doubt, of the, uh, of the book written by the Australian indicating that uh, there was a strong possibility that the Indians invented this incursion in an effort to bring about a reversal of our policy so that they'd have some excuse for getting military aid from the United States and abandoning this policy of Panchshila, which by then they realized um, uh, was no longer very significant. Do you think there's any truth to that kind of allegation that this I, was manufactured? I, no, I don't think so. <clears throat> I, I really do not. I think the um, the Chinese, uh, of course, didn't go as far as they did later in '62. They they uh, they moved into territory which India claimed, uh, which was uh, really disputed territory, and I think. Um, the Chinese, uh, I think, were getting perhaps a little concerned about growing English, uh, Indian development and uh, India's importance in the world and wanted to demonstrate perhaps that, uh, that they were the, going to be the big power in Asia, not India. That uh, India was making headway and making progress uh, economically in many other ways. And I think this aroused 
Chinese uh, enmity, jealousy really, of what India was doing and, and what its importance seemed to be in the world. And uh, while they themselves were pretty self-contained and as far as policy went, uh, that they wanted to teach India a lesson as they're probably trying to do now to the Vietnamese. The, um, the um, rather clumsy behavior of the Russians in, in small things as well as large things in diplomacy has always intrigued me. I remember once on a, on a visit to Gandhi's tomb in Delhi noting that uh, the American tourists who were there and other European tourists quite scrupulously took off their shoes, as is the proper etiquette, yes. in visiting Gandhi's tomb. But I also noticed that the Russian tourists who were there did not do it, but rather walked clumsily yeah. into the tomb area, yeah. much to the consternation of the, yeah. of the Indian uh, bystanders and so on. Uh, yes. Would you say that this typified uh, generally a, a, um, a Russian behavior with respect to, uh, to Indian customs, both Hindu and Muslim? I think, uh, I think probably it did, yes. I think the, uh, the Russians um, pretty uh, practical people and don't pay so much attention to uh, Indian customs as, as we would, I think, or not as sensitive to it, perhaps. But. Um, of course, the Russians, uh, during my period there, were supporting the uh, communist parties in India very liberally, financially. And, uh, and the, I think uh, that was one thing. I think, of course, the Indians were aware of it, and Mr. Nero must have been aware of it. But, uh, uh, and they were the Communist parties, of course, were opposing the, the Congress party. So that was a, some cause of potential friction, but it never, they let it never get to the surface. You had mentioned earlier, Mr. Ambassador, the, um, our own foreign aid uh, program in India, which was quite extensive, and then the aid programs of, of private philanthropy, such as the Ford Foundation under Douglas Enzmiger, the Asia Foundation program at one time under Dick Park. Um, now, in some other countries, notably in Pakistan, there often was competition among these various aid-giving programs, especially the private ones vis-a-vis -vis our own government program. Uh, I wonder if that was true in India at all during this period. No, I think not. I think our relations <coughs> were very close with the Ford Foundation, the Asia Foundation, uh, Doug Ensminger and I worked very closely together. Uh, when Tyler Wood came, I had him appoint as economic officer uh, and aid and uh, aid director, so that uh, those the aid and the embassy worked closely together. His relations with uh, Ensminger too were very excellent, and. Uh, and uh, so were uh, his relations with the Asia Foundation. So I would say that we had a very smooth working team in India and without any frictions, and uh, each one appreciating what the other was doing. The, uh, the Ford Foundation was particularly interested in two aspects, as you know, agriculture and education, and concentrated on that. Uh, the aid, aid program involved uh, food for peace, involved work in agriculture, uh, work in the industrial sector, too, uh, and, and education, too, to an, uh, to an extent. But I remember, for example, um, when we wanted some people there, I think it was in the educational field, I went to Doug Edsminger and asked if um, I'd wanted them in responsible positions and asked him if he couldn't arrange to take care of it said, it will take me three or four months to get people cleared in Washington, and you can pay them more than we can. So if you can do it, you'll get better people there. And he, he agreed to go ahead with it. So that that sort of relationship existed between us. And we did have a very, very excellent working team, I think, there, a very smooth working team. The, uh, the Ford Foundation, of course, has cut back very largely, as you know now, in India and, else, and internationally in general, but uh, 
there with Ensminger, it was a very large program. One aspect of the uh, appointment of ambassadors to India has always intrigued me. The, since uh, your time there as ambassador, we've had such people as Chester Bowles and uh, Patrick Moynihan and John Kenneth Gilbraith and now Goheen, the former president of Princeton. And since I spent most of my time in Pakistan, I would compare these appointments to those made in, in, uh, in Pakistan. It would seem that India seems to get, for the most part, American ambassadors who are not career people, as indeed you were a career man. I was but, not a career man, no. Uh, yes, that is not a career man in the sense of having been a foreign service officer, but, no. yeah, but a career man in the sense of having been in the service, oh, I mean, yes, a diplomatic service a for so many years. Yes. Nevertheless. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you see, I was fired by the Republicans, but rehired. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was replaced in India by Claire Luce mm -hmm. when the Republicans came in. Mm -hmm. Then I spent three years as president of the American Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And then President Eisenhower asked me to go uh, to India. But mm -hmm. what, what, yes, the, the, uh, the, uh, what I was really getting at is that we had uh, a whole series of short-term ambassadors of a rather, of a rather flamboyant uh, personality, let's say, who would, uh, who, who, who seemed to have some axe to grind. I think probably this is true of at least three of these four I've named. And my impression was that uh, the conduct of diplomacy during this period, that is, with, with people like this, wasn't nearly as effective as the conduct of diplomacy when you were the ambassador, as, as someone true who wasn't a career man, a political appointee, but nevertheless someone who had been in diplomatic yes. service for yeah, a long yes. period of time. Yes, sure. <clears throat> surely. Yes, well, I think that's true. I think that um, uh, some of the people who were appointed uh, really only wanted to go for short terms, but just, I mean, more or less for the experience. Uh, but um, I had the uh, advantage of having been there for a longer period of time, which makes a difference. It, uh, I was there for just over four years. My predecessor, uh, Senator Cooper, John Cooper was there, I think, for less than two years, and, and Ken Galbraith was there for two years. When his, his leave from Harvard expired, he left, and so true were the others. And they had been, uh, most of them served for only, only a couple of years. But I think, uh, and like everything else, diplomacy is same principle applies. It takes time to learn them, mm -hmm. to learn the job. You have to learn on the job. And if you're only there for two years, you just about got the job learned when you leave. This was used to it was true with the, the military situation in Vietnam, where the military would come out for 12 months, go. Uh, it took an officer so couple of months to learn the job, and the last couple of months he was wondering where he was going next. Mm -hmm. So he only got a few months of effective service. Same principle applies in diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Now, in your tour as ambassador, you had, not only in India, but indeed in Nepal, had, of course, extensive contact with, with two important religious communities, indeed the two most important communities in the in the subcontinent, namely Hindus and uh, and Muslim, um, and uh, there were, after all, in India, at least two two presidents of India who were Muslim, and the bulk of the ministers in the cabinets too were Hindu, with a sprinkling of Sikhs and so on. But I wonder if you can make any comment about um, the contrasting behavior patterns and uh, let's say personality patterns, as between let us say the Hindu the Hindu personality and the, and the Muslim personality. I'm thinking especially of those two religious communities. <clears throat> yes, I think the, uh, <clears throat> the Muslim community is uh, easier for us to, uh, to understand than the Hindu. Uh, the Hindu is more convoluted, more uh, very diversified. Uh, the Muslim, and particularly the uh, Sikhs, uh, 
talk in more direct, practical terms. That's why I think it's been it was easier for us to get on with the Pakistanis and with the Indians. I mean, they, they might say talk our language in a sense. And uh, uh, therefore, I think it's easier for us to, do, to get on with them and to understand them than the Hindu. Uh, Hindu's religion, as you know, is very complicated. And uh, with many gods, many customs, and variety of customs among the Hindus uh, themselves. Uh, it's not only language, but it's, uh, it's customs too. So that uh, I do think the, uh, the, we find the Muslim approach, uh, particularly as represented too by the sheikhs, uh, the uh, Sikhs, uh, more direct, more direct uh, approach, a more direct manner of dealing uh, than the Hindu. And uh, which is, in a sense, complicates our relations, of course, with the Indians too. But uh, we were very fortunate, I think, uh, Although we disagreed with many of Mr. Nero's policies, very fortunate that Mr. Nero was in power for as long as he was and held the country together at a crucial period of its history, as no other person could have done. And as we're seeing now, I mean, uh, uh, Mrs. Gandhi, of course, was in power for, what, 15, 17 years, but uh, subsequent to that, but now the situation has changed radically and uh, one uh, isn't sure how it's going to develop. The image which most Americans had of India tended to be an image which was reflected essentially from the personality and the behavior of, 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 uh, of Mahatma Gandhi, namely a pacifist, someone who believed in non-violence, Satyagraha and the other aspects of his, of his philosophy. And a good deal of the American press was rather startled at the time of the, uh, of the Chinese invasion and the Indian fight against China as a consequence of this invasion, saying that they couldn't quite believe that India was, was this kind of nation which would ever fight and, uh, and conduct activities of this kind. Uh, do you have any observations to make about that? The, well, I think... Was, was this image wrong, the image which the Americans had? So. To the extent that the Indians wouldn't fight, yes, it was wrong. But I, I think the fact is, as you mentioned, uh, many Americans were uh, intrigued and, and uh, attracted by many of the... Uh, in Gan not only Gandhi's philosophy, but Hinduism, too, in general. And uh, when... Uh, and Mrs. Gandhi started on her uh, era of repression there, and there was great criticism in this country of what Indians were doing. Indian businessmen who came to Washington would come in to see me and, and uh, tell me that in their view that the situation had been greatly improved, that there was order in the country, that people were at work and all this sort of thing. And why did we feel the way we did? I said, well, I think we feel that way because I think, I think Americans generally had a love affair with India. They saw India as the great democracy in Asia and as the hope of democracy in Asia and looked on India and the United States as the world's two great and largest democracies. And we hoped India would be a leader in Asia. And now to see what's happening has, has uh, disappointed people who felt that way very strongly. And as a, as a rejected lover, they feel more strongly <laughs> than they would otherwise. And uh, I think this is the reason for it. And I, I think that's true. Now, I think uh, with the new government in power that, that uh, the attitude is changing somewhat just as it has changed in the Indian government itself. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi, as you know, was very much attracted by the Soviet model. 
more so, I think, uh, even than her father. And, uh, and look to the Soviets for weapons and uh, as, well as, as well as a model, perhaps, to, 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 a, to follow to a degree. Uh, but now, uh, the new government, the Janata Party, uh, has taken a different, a different stance and uh, is trying to follow an even more even-handed policy. And I think uh, already our relations have Im shown signs of improvement. Certainly when I was there, I felt that. This, I was there in December and January this year, last year, this January this year. That, um, uh, the elements in the new government are, are more disposed to an even-handed relationship. Someone said that uh, Mrs. Gandhi's great mistake was putting all of the disparate factions together in the same jail. <laughs> they got to know one another and finally got together. Whether they got to hold together is another thing, I don't know. <laughs> Now, that raises the whole question of leadership of the present government and leadership of the, of the Janata Party. I <clears throat> have always been tremendously impressed by, uh, by Moraji Desai, as, uh, especially when he was Minister of Finance, and then subsequently for a while was Chairman of the Administrative Reforms Commission, mm. and uh, met him on one occasion in that connection, and was much impressed also when he actually resigned as Chairman of that commission because he said it was being too politicized, and he wasn't able to really yeah. do much in, <clears throat> yes. and, uh, in, uh, in the form of, admi of, um, of administrative reform. I wonder what impressions you have of him as prime minister, um, and what impression you have generally of, of, of the present cabinet and the Janata party uh, and its capacity to lead the country, uh, as Mrs. Gandhi did. Well, it's a very good question, <clears throat> and I, uh, I frankly uh, tell you that I don't know the answer. But uh, I, uh, uh, Maranji, I think, is delighted at being where he is. He's reached his peak, and this is what he always wanted to be, as prime minister, and he's not too concerned about what happens about anything else, as long as he's prime minister. Uh, but uh, whether the Janata party can get their act together, I don't know. Uh, you read the uh, Indian press, as I did, for over a period of six weeks' time, and the front page is, is full of squabbles within the Janata Party. Charan Singh and Moraji, and Charan Singh, and yet Charan Singh in uh, Uttar Pradesh, his own man being defeated as uh, chief minister. So, uh, and finally, the thing patched up with Charan Singh coming in as a vice prime minister along with uh, uh, Jangjeeva Maram. And uh, whether they can work together in the long run, I don't know. But also, and, and Moraji has his Achilles heel, I think, in the question of his son's situation. Where he's resisted any investigation of his son's activities, just as uh, Sanjay, I think, did in Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, if it hadn't been for his excesses, she might not have been defeated. Uh, but his excesses in his whole birth control family pro planning program and uh, got roused such resentment, in, in, uh, particularly in the agricultural areas of the country, that. Uh, they turned against her, and she kept supporting him, of course, and turned against her. But um, Maraji may have the same blind spot toward his son that she's had toward hers, uh, which may have some effect eventually, but uh, certainly, as far as Maraji's son goes, they don't affect the general populace as Sanjay's did. Uh, but. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in spite of all this, uh, what you see, this appears to be dissension within the party, that India has made great progress in the years since I left there in 61. When I was there, they had a deficit in food, 
They now have a surplus of 20 million tons. Uh, when I was there, they had a deficit and a balance of, balance of payments and trade. Now they got five billion surplus. The industrial base has expanded very substantially and they're exporting a great many things now. And they're exporting technology as well. And uh, yet the big problem is still there, that of population. I remember when I left there, somebody asked Mr. Nero how many problems he said. He said, I have 435 million. Today, they've got 635 million. So that the embassy people told me when I was there that while this, is, this great progress is, is, is true and has occurred, the fact is because of the increase in population, the average per capita intake isn't any bigger than it was 20 years ago. Uh, this is the great problem of the country. A country that's about 45% the size of the continental United States with 635 million people in it. Mr. Ambassador, we hear, we, we hear very little about the Kashmir problem now, Jammu and Kashmir, but when you were there, this was a very serious and critical problem indeed in relations not only between Pakistan and India, but also in relations with the United States. Pakistan at the time rather resented the fact that the United States did not take a more unequivocal position supporting the Pakistan view on the, the necessity for a plebiscite in Kashmir. India, on the other hand, as we know, took the view that the question didn't arise, as the Indians like to yes, say. Yeah. It was integrated <laughs> as a state in India, and that was that, yeah. and, and, yes. uh, and it won't be discussed. Um, did you encounter any difficulties in, in reflecting to India the the point of view of the United States on the, on the Kashmir issue? Yes, <clears throat> uh, I did find some difficulties. <coughs> and of course, particularly with Krishna Menon, who was a crusader on the subject, but uh, not so much with Mr. Nehru, who, um, well, holding firmly to the position, as you say, that the question didn't arise, uh, nevertheless was not vehement about it and was not uh, uh, rabid in any sense of the word, but rather rather content to sit on his position. <laughs> and, uh, and we, for our part, well, we would have welcomed some progress in that connection, also had the feeling rather that uh, this was a situation which only time could work out without getting into hostilities, actually and that we ought to give the problem time. It was similar, our attitude then was similar to uh, our position on Trieste when I was ambassador in Italy. When we felt then that, and, and I think it's true in diplomacy, there are, there are times to act, to know when to act, and times to know when not to act. And during my time in, in Italy, which was brief, uh, that was a period when we felt was was not the time to act. I remember in talking to Mr. de Gasperi, as Prime Minister, suggesting to him a solution for Trieste, which eventually was similar to what was eventually worked out and adopted. He said, why, well, Mr. Ambassador, if I accepted that, my government would fall tomorrow. Mm. It wasn't until he'd had the next election that he was in a strong enough position, really, to negotiate on Trieste. Then it was worked out secretly with, as you know, with Tommy Thompson, Bella Bitt, who was my colleague in Rome at the time, uh, Brosio, the Italian, and the Indian, I've forgotten his name, and worked out in London, but along those lines. But it wouldn't, couldn't have been worked out before that. And our feeling about Pakistan and, the, and about Kashmir was that uh, the best thing to do was to try to to keep the thing, keep it under control and see whether time wouldn't evolve a relationship between the two countries which would allow some kind of some kind of settlement of course that didn't happen but uh, but anyway that was our view at the time we hear a good deal about the so-called steel frame of the of administration in india which was one of the great legacies i think of of um, of the British imperial experience there, and the ICS, which after independence became converted into the IAS, the Indian Administrative Service, mm. 
And uh, one is led to believe that um, while the internal aspects of the bureaucracy were very good indeed in India, that the Indian Foreign Service, the diplomatic service, was perhaps not quite so competent, largely because this was an activity which the British reserved for themselves up until the time of independence. It, it, it was largely Britons who conducted foreign policy rather than Indians. And hence, when India was made independent in 1947, there was not the, the same kind of reservoir of experienced talent in the conduct of foreign affairs as there was for the conduct of, 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 of internal administration. Uh, would this be your impression at all? Did you? Yes. Get <clears throat> I, th I think that's partly true. And uh, because, as you remember, uh, re remember, India <laughs> was really governed by a very small handful of, of Englishmen. I don't know, what was it? Five or six hundred or something like that. And all the rest of them were, were trained Indians. It's a very interesting book. I'd recommend a uh, fascinating book just come out, Letters of an Indian Judge to an English Gentlewoman. Mm. And his, his, the insights you get from that into the workings of the Indian government, the Indian Administrative Service, and, uh, and the attitude toward the British, toward the West, is fascinating. And uh, it's well worth reading. The, uh, uh, and I think that's true. And I think the... Uh, <coughs> On the other hand, today, the, the most intense competition among Indian servants, civil servants, young English, uh, young, young people going into government service is for the foreign service. That's considered the premier job. I had a personal example of that. The, uh, the present Indian foreign minister, Jagat Mehta, is a very close friend of mine and my wife's. and, and uh, his older son, uh, who went to Oxford uh, and took the examinations, and I think there were, in his group there were 48 chosen for the Foreign Service and the balance for the Indian Administrative Service, and he missed out by one mm -hmm. and is now in the Administrative Service, but he was very disappointed and lost out on the oral test when somebody was to occasion to criticize him. But so that uh, they are trying to develop. But uh, the, the core of uh, experienced uh, uh, diplomats and experience in the foreign service is, is still uh, lacking in, uh, in, in numbers and experience. The present foreign secretary, Jagat Mehta, who was really the foreign minister, is a political appointee, of course, a cabinet minister, but he really runs foreign affairs and uh, is trying to get out and to get somebody to replace him, and, and uh, they just can't find somebody. And they say, no, you've got to stay, regardless of the fact that he's working himself to death. But it, there, is a, there is, I think, that uh, some lack there, but... Um, they do have, they've had very good men in the United States, uh, with one or two exceptions. Uh, Gil Mehta, when I, he was in here when I was in India, very, very able. B.K. Uh, Nehru, L.K. Jar, uh, President of Astus, very highly intelligent. So they've, they've certainly sent to first class people to us. Most of their ambassadors, I think the present ambassador is a businessman, as I recall. He's a lawyer. He's a, oh, oh, yes, yeah. a lawyer, yes. Very able. Mm -hmm. Very able. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ambassador, with the Janata Party in control now of Indian government and the Congress Party having been defeated for the first time in Indian history since independence, what do you think are the possibilities of the Congress Party getting together? We know it's already split in two, but ultimately getting together and... Uh, uh, being effective and forceful against the Janata Party. Are there any such possibilities, do you think? Well, I think <clears throat> there are some possibilities. Um, we, I saw Mrs. Gandhi when I was there and asked her that question. And she said, oh, well, to all effects, we are together. But 
and others people that I question say they're not so sure that that's true, that, uh, that she may think so, but Swan Singh may not think so. I didn't have a chance to talk to him, I don't know. But uh, certainly uh, circumstances would indicate that if they hoped to return to power, they'd have to get together. The, uh, the, uh, I think if the party is split, uh, the chances, her chance of returning to power is not very good. Now, many people that I talked with seem to think that she probably would return to power eventually, that the Janata Party would not be able to get us act together sufficiently to stay in power for another term. The uh, elections come up, I think, in 82, isn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, Others, however, feel that it uh, would be very difficult for her to get back again. That uh, what happened here during the days of this uh, emergency, uh, and what's happened with uh, uh, her own family, her son, and so forth, uh, militate against her. She does, as you know, run strong in the south of India. And that's where the Congress Party got most of its... Uh, seats in the last parliament. Of course, there's always been this rivalry, as you know, between the North and South in language and everything else. And uh, uh, the effort to force Hindi as a national language has antagonized the South. Uh, I remember talking to Dr. Radhakrishnan when I was there. He was vice president. And the, the language question arose then in Bombay and elsewhere. And he said, well, I, I would settle the language question. He said, I would say Hindu, Hindi is a national language, and I say, would say that in English is a national language because we can't get along without it, mm -hmm. which is true. Yes. And uh, so she does wrong, run strongly there, but not in the north and uh, in the industrialized sector. So, um, uh, I think it's uh, pretty much a toss-up whether, whether I think they, I would think the Congress two parties would eventually unite for purposes of election, but uh, whether they'll be strong enough to come back, I, I think is anybody's guess. When we talk about um, the current uh, Prime Minister of India, Moraji Desai, or indeed Mrs. Gandhi or her father, the late Prime Minister Nato, we think in terms of people trained at the London School of Economics, and again, a common assertion made both in this country and in Britain, is that the bulk of that generation of Indian leadership were trained at the London School, and there they picked up what are often regarded as half-baked ideas of socialism from Harold Lasky, who was yeah. a very scintillating lecturer, as you know, and who taught yes. most <laughs> of them, and hence, <clears throat> this infusion of a kind of uh, Sydney and Beatrice Webb type of Fabian socialism entered into the Indian ideology and has had very profound effect on Indian political thought. Would you, what would be your reaction to that? Did you see any evidence of that kind of thinking on the part of either Prime Minister Nadeau or Mrs. Gandhi or indeed uh, Prime Minister Desai? <clears throat> uh, well, uh, no, not very much, really. I think Mr. Nero was more practical and saw the situation as primarily a, a one of economic development. And uh, uh, therefore, and I think perhaps put too much emphasis on, on uh, industrial, on the industrial sector and not enough emphasis on the agricultural sector, because I think he was obsessed with this, talked to me about this idea that you must, a developing country must expand industrially. It's going to make progress. And I think uh, the effort to get into the public sector in, in a big way was uh, overemphasized. I think it would have been better had they uh, encouraged the private sector 
to expand and develop more, and I think it would have been done more efficiently than, for instance, running the steel mills. Maranje, on the other hand, uh, is, is I think in my talk with him this recently, uh, is turning his attention much more to the agricultural part of the country, which after all is, uh, is the biggest, by far the biggest part of the country. As somebody said, uh, who was an article in the New York Times, by, I've forgotten his name now, but he said there are really two Indias. There's a hundred million uh, Indians who are well-to-do, middle class, upper class, uh, prosperous, and 500 million Indians who are still living at this level of existence, subsistence level. And in my talk with Maraja, he emphasized uh, very strongly that he intended to, to put much more attention to development in the agricultural sector, whether he's, he'll do this on, on the practical terms it will be successful, I don't know. I think that's the big question. What he wants to do is to develop more local industry, cottage industry, and uh, uh, not put so much emphasis on uh, uh, in industrial expansion in the, in the public sector. Now, uh, as he said, trying to bring up the level of, uh, of the four-fifths of the population. But um, how, how successful that will be, I don't know, but it's something like the, what he envisages, I think, is something like the Panchayat system in Nepal. Mm -hmm. That raises the very fascinating question, because in a sense, I suppose, Moraji wants to go back to a kind of Gandhianism. It was Gandhi, as we all know, who, yes. who talked about the cottage industries, who was against yeah. industrialization, yes. and Nader, yeah. his chief lieutenant, seemed to have abandoned that. Yeah. Now Maraji Desai, in a way, goes back to yes. his, the Gandhian philosophy and the like, and in so doing, what is occurring in India, it seems to me, is rather compatible with what's occurring in many other countries, which seek to go back to their indigenous roots, so to speak. Mm whether it's Islam in the case of some countries, or yes. in the case of India, the Panchayats, yes. rural development, and so on. Yeah. I wonder if you could make some observations on that, particularly on the community development program, the Panchayats. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, I think that's true. I think there is a, a tendency. Uh, I think uh, perhaps one might say uh, an awakening to the fact that uh, that uh, industrial expansion hasn't been enough in these countries. I think this was the undoing of the Shah in Iran, too. One of the contributing causes, and maybe there are others too. But but uh, that, as in India, industrial expansion has quite remarkably taken place there. Nevertheless. Four fifths of the population are still and haven't got, haven't benefited appreciably from it, uh, and that therefore uh, much more, much more attention has to be given to that element of the population if stability is to be maintained in the country as a whole. That if it isn't, that this may lead to an overturn of the existing power, existing government. And I think that's evidenced here in, in your countries that you cite. I think, uh, I think you're quite right about that. Now one might conclude then that this so-called indigenization or return to basic Indian roots is, is essentially a good thing and uh, that perhaps um, uh, uh, too much uh, imitation of, of something which is American or something which is Western without due mm. regard to the indigenous roots of the system uh, yes. could be bad, would you say? I, I think it's a, yes, yeah. I think it's a largely a question of emphasis. How much you put on one and how much you put on the other and what sort of balance you work out, but the industrialization is essential too. There's no, uh, that's true. But so is the satisfaction of, of uh, say, four-fifths of the population has to see something more than what they've been accustomed to for generations while they see... 
uh, other fifth of the country benefiting very greatly from the industrialization process. So I think the question of judgment and balance and how to, how to work out that situation is the essential thing and the difficult thing to do, too. But I, I do think the, uh, while agricultural production has expanded in India, but still the way the average farmer lives hasn't changed very much.